Okay, so yeah. Um, great, thanks everybody for, for joining. It looks like we have a pretty good group. I'm sorry we can't have our normal um, Winsar business luncheon at AGU uh, for the second year in a row. We're really fingers crossed for next year, but um, thanks for being here. So we've got um, a good set of presentations um, from, um, I guess we're gonna have an uh, introduction from Bex and then we'll have uh, presentations from a couple of um, different space agencies and different projects that are, um, you know, uh, talking about their, uh, their efforts over the last year related to INSAR. And then we'll hopefully have some time for, um, for your questions and feedback about WINSAR. You know, WINSAR is really at a kind of a, a critical juncture right now, um, moving forward to the EarthScope Consortium um, sort of at the end of next year. So uh, we really wanna know what are your priorities and, and what are the things that are important to you uh, as, we, as we go through that. So I guess first we'll have the, the introduction from Bex. Hi, everybody. So uh, most of this agenda looks way more interesting than a greeting from me. So I'll be I'll be brief. Um, I just want to reiterate what Eric said that we are really taking a comprehensive and hopefully thoughtful look at the role of imaging, um, both in UNAVCO for the coming year, but also as we look forward to the Earthscope Consortium um, as an integrated geophysical support facility. So we really, really, in particular, want input from this community about your priorities, your vision, um, and ways that we can really be innovators in, in multidisciplinary and multi-data initiatives. So, you know, both your, your science needs and, and your use cases, but also things that need to be addressed in, in looking at integrated big data. I think we're interested in, in hearing about in, in some technical detail um, because we want to position UNAVCO and EarthScope to continue to innovate in this space and, and enable exciting science. So that's, that's kind of a weighty charge to you all. Um, and it's a bit different than what WINSAR has been about over the past several years, um, but we really genuinely do both need and want um, your perspective on this. And, and points of contact can be, you know, through the WINSAR Executive Committee, um, through Chris Crosby at UNAVCO, to me, um, although my technical expertise is not as great as Chris's. Um, but all or any other contact that you have at, at either Iris or UNAVCO. Uh, I think this is an exciting moment with the, the combination of, of NISAR coming and Earthscope being born to really rethink what we do around imaging. Uh, so please help us get it right, or at least help us be in a position to get it right over the next five years or so. Um, and I look forward to both seeing what is presented today and, and hearing from you, uh, whatever you're thinking about imaging and what we can do to make it um, or help it continue to be a, a key part of our portfolio in science support. Great, thanks a lot, Bex. Um, yeah, we're really happy to to be a part of, of UNAVCO and the first the future Earthscope Consortium. So yeah, we're looking forward to you know having everyone's feedback on that and, and really you know pushing for imaging as a, a key part of that. Um, so I had a couple of slides and then we'll go through so um, from UNAVCO and then from JAXA, ESA, NASA, NISAR, and ICE, uh, GM, TSAR, the Geo Supersites, uh, UAV SAR, and then ASF. Uh, in that order. So, um, uh, and you know, I wanted to point out we, we have kind of planned it for a couple of quick questions in between presentations as we're sort of transitioning between the, the different slides. Um, but, you know, you can also uh, please feel free to put your questions in the chat um, and, and the speakers can answer them there. Um, and then, you know, hopefully we've planned this for an hour and a half. So, hopefully, we'll be done 
uh, with enough time to have some questions uh, afterwards and discussion. Um, you know, and of course, please, you know, if you have any other questions you don't have uh, answered here, send send me or the, the other committee members an email or anything like that. Um, Elis, could you go ahead and share those slides again? So then on the next slide, um, so WinSAR, um, we are a group of, you know, INSAR users and researchers, and the original um, goal of WinSAR was, was to be the Western North America INSAR consortium. So um, really that, that initially was kind of started with the goal of, of producing an archive of SAR data over Western North America um, with the people who were interested in, in working on that. But, you know, since that time, uh, obviously, SAR data has become a lot more uh, open and available. So we still advocate for open access to SAR data. Um, and we have really expanded into a lot of um, uh, planning and, and sponsoring of training courses, um, software, so you can get a license to some of the ICE components, um, uh, and also data products. So we, we host, um, like, derived data products. Um, and then, you know, hopefully we can we'll be able to feedback to, you know, both space agencies and to UNAVCO and Earthscope about best practices and policies for, for this data. Um, and the committee, the executive committee is comprised of myself, um, David Beckhart at JPL, Katya Timofieva at JPL, uh, Ann Chen at UT Austin, Brent Minchu at MIT, and then Christy Tiampo was the chair um, for the previous two years uh, from C. Boulder she's still serving on. So um, we don't have elections this year. There will be a, another uh, set of elections next year to elect the next committee for two years. Um, so next slide. So um, yeah, so at, as you know, we've, uh, we've been in a pandemic. And um, so we, we moved the training courses that were previously held in person um, to online last year. And uh, that turned out to be a huge success um, so we were really able to expand the participation, especially internationally. Um, and so, uh, yeah, next slide. We, um, we hosted, um, so really three main training courses were done this year. So we had the INSAR theory and processing with GMT-SAR and also with ICE. The GMT-SAR one was kind of done in a, a sort of asynchronous long format course over about a month. Um, and then the, the ICE um, was done in August uh, with ASF support for sort of access to um, online cloud processing. So both of those had over 100 participants. Um, we actually had more, uh, more uh, registrants than we could admit to those courses. And so we had to actually kind of um, prioritize the WinSAR members for, for those courses, but um, it was a challenge to pick who was who could attend. So those are also available online, so you can all um, you know view the, the course videos and everything uh, online on the UNEPCO website. Um, and then there was also a, an INSAR data interpretation and analysis for non-specialists. So that was at the Sage Gage meeting as one of the sort of prior uh, uh, workshops. Um, and so I hope that was a good success. Also, kind of talking more um, about just, you know, not, not the data processing, but the, the data interpretation and how to use it. Um, as you all know, INSAR can be a little bit confusing for non-specialists. So um, we, we plan to actually continue these courses online. Um, it's really expanded our, our uh, number of participants um, and, you know, hopefully maintain some of these other uh, courses as well. Um, but we're thinking about hopefully uh, having in-person short courses um, for, uh, for maybe advanced topics uh, in the future um, as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, the other thing that, that we've done is, you know, kind of tried to highlight WinSAR at a few uh, meetings. These are all online meetings, of course, but um, at JAXA, we had a virtual poster and at Fringe, uh, we also had a virtual poster, which was sort of a video where we kind of highlighted different activities um, that had been, um, uh, you know, accomplished in the last year with, with INSAR that was related to the WinSAR archive. Um, so, yeah, so thanks for those of you who sent those results so that we could highlight your work. Um, and next slide. 
And then, yeah, so we'll go to, to Chris. Do you guys have any questions? If you have any questions for the WinSTAR committee, um, you know, go ahead and post them in the chat and we'll try to get this uh, rolling along. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, so I'm Chris Crosby. I'm the Geodetic Imaging Project Manager at UNAVCO. Um, so we're responsible for sort of WinSAR support um, at the facility. So just a quick update on things that have happened in the last year. Oh, actually, mostly next, next slide. I forgot I'm not in control. <laughs> um, so just a quick reminder that uh, WinSAR is operated by UNAVCO under the, the GAGE facility cooperative agreement, um, which was through September 2023. Now there's this planned extension of two more years. Uh, and that funding comes actually split between um, NSF and NASA. So that's a sort of 50-50 ratio at roughly one FTE of support. And the list of activities are ones that you're all probably quite familiar with. So it's the support of the executive committee, kind of archive um, operations, data ordering, tasking, data ingest, the web portal, um, ICE software access, although ICE is now open source, so that's less of an activity largely, and then um, this community short course support that Eric just spoke to, spoke about. So next slide. So there's the WinSAR community kind of numbers. There's 318 inst WinSAR institutional members. So that's an increase of five in the past year um, and 2016 registered users. So 150 additional in 2021. Um, and so that's sort of roughly the same as previous years. The new member institutions might be declining slightly because of this. If you recall, we've talked about this in the past that I, membership of WinSAR was required for ICE access. So now that people can get ICE as an open source product, there's less interest, I think, in WinSAR from a pure membership perspective, especially for international users who are not voting members of WinSAR who were, just, who were previously joining just simply for ICE access. Um, there's 197 terabytes of data currently in the archive available for download. Um, and that's up by 10 or 20 terabytes from last year. Um, one just quick note is that JAXA deprecated the GUI2 interface that we were using to, to kind of automate the, the ALOS2 download and ingest process. Um, so I think that happened early summer. And so the total amount of data ingested has sort of flattened because it was ALOS2 was largely what was driving that. Um, the, the data increases in the past several years. And so maybe we'll hear an update from from it, um, about ALOS2 later in this set of presentations. Next slide. So one of the things we did this summer was we had um, a USIP intern. This is the UNAFCA Summer Internship Program. Um, Becca Bussard is a PhD candidate at University of Oregon. The focus on SAR for kind of volcano deformation um, joined us and worked through the summer during the whole um, standard USIP period, which is 11 weeks, but then actually kept her on for another sort of, I think six weeks beyond that period or five weeks beyond that period, because she was helping with ICE, the ICE short course and some other tasks. And so she did a ton of work this summer and, and produced a lot of really cool products that um, are out there. And I'll do a quick review of those. And um, we're working on sort of website content updates to make these easier to find from the WinSAR webpage. So first thing is she created two tutorial videos on the Cicera, um, API and GUI interfaces. So these are the kind of search and access tools that were developed many, not five years ago, but are still used by a lot of people. And so she put together very simple tutorials on how to utilize both of those that are on the YouTube um, channel for UNAVCO. Next slide. Um, she also took the, and this was in collaboration with the, uh, with the ICE short course team, Paul and his crew. Um, she took the 2020 ICE short course, which had been recorded um, as these sort of day long videos and she diced them up into a whole suite of much shorter 24 videos that sort of go through the structure. And the idea was to take that content, which is quite rich, but was sort of hard to navigate because there were these eight, you know, eight ish hour blocks of video. Um, and so she went through that whole archive of video and created a suite of 24 new videos. Each one has a consistent sort of start page and end page and is structured such that it sort of matches the structure of that course. And so this is a really great resource for, for people who want to sort of self-educate on, on ICE and, and that whole processing tool set, um, or just learn some more INSAR theory, uh, potentially a good resource also for, for pointing your grad students at if you want them to go come up to speed and they haven't taken one of the courses that we teach sort of more synchronously. Um, so she, so Becca did that, next slide. Um, she also developed a suite of Jupyter Notebooks, uh, five Jupyter Notebooks that are um, a little more compact than what is in, used in the in the ICE course. 
Um, and so these are all available through the UNAFCA um, Jupiter Lab um, and are potentially interesting because they are a little more again oriented towards self-teaching and, and sort of basic crash course in, in ice utilization examples of various types of, of processing workflows. Um, and so that was another great contribution she made. And then I think my last slide, oh no, two more. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned earlier, sorry, go back one, uh, Melissa. Uh, Becca also helped out with the ICE short course this summer, um, working with Paul and the rest of the crew from JPL who teaches that. Um, and so she did she did a lot of helping preparing. She tested a lot of the notebooks that were used in that course. She sort of helped to coordinate the TAs and then she did a, a quite a bit of grading. And so this was another big, I think, um, helpful contribution that was made by the UNAVCO in support of this course. And maybe something we'll try to do again this summer if it was, it was useful. Um, and then the last slide, for me, Melissa. So as I mentioned earlier, we're working on a, a web content review and actually Becca did a great job of this, helping me this summer kind of go through the whole, every place that SARS talked about, either on the UNAVCA webpage or on the Winsor webpage, and sort of trying to identify legacy language of which there is quite a bit. And also try to sort of better map the connectivity between the UNAVCO gauge content and Winsar because these are you know two, are two sort of distinct brands, but they're also quite tightly intermingled. And there's kind of, illogical connectivity between them, so to speak, if you're, if you're, if you're sort of coming in from a novice user perspective and trying to figure out where various resources are, are available. And so I'm going to try to do the, some of the web updates to reflect some of those changes over the coming months, so keep an eye out for that. And then my last sort of reminder is to uh, the institutional representatives of WinSAR, so each institutional member has a rep. Um, and one of the challenges is that you, people sign up and then we don't have a great process to maintain that list and keep it current. And so Melissa and I did a lot of work before the last election in 2020 um, to verify that we had the right sort of rep at the right institution because that affects our ability to get to a quorum when the election happens. And so we had something like a 46% response rate to our initial inquiry, but I just want to remind all of you out there to please, if, you're, <laughs> if you think you're the institutional rep at an institution, please check the institutional rep page, which is shown there on the, and, and verify that you are correctly listed. And if you've recently changed institutions or there's been a, um, or something like that, please let us know so we can keep this current. Because if we don't, it's going to become a problem again in 2022 when we have to go through our next election. So that was it for me. We can move on to the next presentation, unless there are questions. Uh, this is Paul Rosen. I just wanted to uh, to uh, say that Becca was absolutely essential. I, I have to thank you, NAFCO, for offering her. We had a, all, all of the instructors had a number of uh, things that came up right around that time that made them very, very busy. Without Becca, I'm not sure we could have pulled off the course as successfully as we did. So thanks so, so much for providing her. Great, thank you. Next is a, a presentation from JAXA um, by uh, Dr. Shinichi Sobue. It's, it's late there, so uh, thank you for joining us late at night. Yeah, uh, good morning for you and uh, good afternoon for the, my colleagues in the ESA. As, uh, as uh, <laughs> Eric already mentioned, it's uh, 1 a.m. in Japanese time. So, I try to say as much as I can, but uh, if you have the, any question, please to contact through the email or some, some ways. But uh, I'm very happy today to make a presentation, not only for the ELOS2 updating, but also the ELOS4 status, especially for the, our first draft of the basic observation plan or basic observation scenario of the ELOS4. I would like to share in such kind of information too. So, could you to go to the next page? Just skipping. Everyone knows the ELOS2 specification, so I don't need to explain this one, I think. So the, go to the next page. Yes. And so currently, the ELOS2 is already spent the seven years on the orbit, and we plan to extend it and the additional uh, years because we plan to have the first formulation flight with ELOS2 with ELOS4. Therefore, the, this is the first time we have the two L-band satellite together 
in during the in the next Japanese physical year in the Japanese physical year 2022. Therefore, the, we try to uh, coordinating the observation plan carefully the eros two with eros four, and also the the yeah that was an, to go and so one of the challenges is because I, I will explain later, but the uh, Eros 4 has a 200 kilometer thrust radius with a 10 meter mode or three meter mode. And therefore, the, by weekly, we can observe on the ground by using the Eros 4. And the main observation ancient angle or, or looking angle of the Eros 4 should be in the right angles. But the uh, Eros 2 can be changing from the right to left easily. Therefore, the, we plan to have the uh, uh, right hand, right, right looking mode for the Eros 4 and the left looking mode for the Eros 2. That means that we have the very good uh, interferometric pair together in the left angle and right angles. So, such kind of the observation we just to discussing internally in JAXA. So next page, please. This is only the state summary that there are no issues. Therefore, the, the, just going to the next page, please. This is a, our collaboration with the international partners, including the NASA, CSA, ESA, and also the AGs. And uh, as a data users in the Asian uh, space agency, the partner to deliver our data. So next page, please. Because of the extension of the, our satellite lifetime for the Eros 2, we decide to reducing the duty cycle from the 50 percent, 50 percent to the 30 percent during the extended period after the five years operation. Therefore, the, we have the little bit of limitation of the observation capabilities, but the, still we have the enough capability to observe in, in the globe. But as I already mentioned, we try to focus in the more in high uh, temporal observation in the selected area. Therefore, the, we have the, a lot of the discussion with our PIs and our partners where should we, we have to have more intensive observation. The next page, please. It's a very small one, but the general idea of the current scenario is mainly uh, we have the uh, SMO three, three meter mode observation in Japan areas, but in the globe, we have at least once a year for the global observation with the 10 meter. But in the tropical region, we have the scan mode observation nine, uh, more than nine times per year. So the next page, please. And the latest uh, software updating. We have the some, we, we know that we have the some issues for the scan mode uh, data. Because uh, some of the people cannot to processing the interferometry by using the scan mode of the level 1.1. We already fixing such problem and the way providing the data with the correct format. There are some issues in the data format uh, or data processing. It was already fixed in August, but uh, still when we fixing the problem, we found the another issues. One of the big challenges is uh, if you would like to have the insert by using the, our scanner data, you need the full aperture data. And the one thing of the full aperture mode data is uh, over the 130 gigabyte per scene. So the, our user is already complained because uh, the, you cannot do downloading from the, uh, your countries. Only the, some of the Japanese user can be downloading such very huge zip compressed data as a single file. Therefore, the, we're careful to discussing with uh, our partners in the NASA, ESA, how to provide such data to the users. That is one of the issues. And we decide that currently the way just to uh, dividing the, those data in the each beam mode data. And maybe we have to ask him that the user can be uh, re-merging together with such kind of separate data. 
I, I will, we, we, we can explain later, not now, but uh, that is one of the big issues because um, maybe the user does not want to get in the 130 gigabyte one single file. So that is one of the issues for us. The next page, please. Uh, this is the same, so can can we speak it? Skipping so in the next page. Moving the next page, please. Ah, uh, yeah, this is the opposite. So, yes, and uh, as I already mentioned, that we would like to just uh, to try to coordinating the how to provide the data and uh, collaborating with uh, our partners, and. Uh, Chris already mentioned that one of the issues is a data interface. We just are moving from the AI to, to the G portal systems. And you can get in the use normal data from the G portal system. But uh, as I already mentioned, one of the big issues is uh, maybe you cannot to get in the scanser level 1.1. It's a CLC data in the full Apache mode. It's a more than 100 gigabyte. So we just to try to uh, upgrading our software to providing the data to the splitting the, this one single zip file to the multiple files for the each beam mode files. But uh, it will be, it takes us some time, maybe several months. Therefore, the end of we fixing these issues, we will let you know. The next page, please. One of the good news, maybe you already know the what I already mentioned in the last two years, we, almost completing the, all of the data processing of the ALOS-1 data in the Aboriginal 2 and the Parsa. And most of the data is already starting to uh, mirroring in the ASF hmm? or Universe Alaska. And uh, so you, you can have the, all of the Parsa data, not only for the SLC data, but also the sort of the ARD data, ARD compatible slope also collected to level 2.2 data. Maybe it's not so interesting in the community, but it's good for the general users. And also the way just sort of starting the, to processing the, all of the scanser data of the Parser 2. And this data is also open to the public. And we already starting to coordinating with NASA to mirroring the, such scanser data. So, you can get in the, all of the level 1.1 data or SLC data. But uh, again, it's a full aperture mode data. So the one data is 130 gigabyte per scene. Therefore, the, we have to talk with uh, uh, ACF people the, how to deliver such data to users. That is one of the challenge. And uh, we estimating that it takes um, about one year to process all of the data. But uh, again, the challenge is how to deliver the, such kind of huge data to the ASF. Even if to using the AWS system, it takes uh, several months to deliver the data. So that we have to carefully to coordinate with the ASF through the NASA about what is a good timing to providing the data. The top priority from the NASA, which I already hear is in the West Coast data of the SLC. Therefore, we starting for the, all of the processing of the scan size SLC data and to start to process uh, delivery the such data to ASF. And later we will starting to the uh, Afri African continent and to processing the, all of the Asian data. But uh, it's, of course, we are happy to sharing the, in the level 1.1 data, but uh, in the Asian users, many interest in the level 2.2 data. Therefore, the, we plan to processing the level 2.2 data from the next year. The next page, please. So just skipping this one, we, we, we don't need to, you can check in later. So next, I, as I said, I'm very happy to sharing some of the ELOS 4 status. And this is a presentation material for the PIM workshop in this November by the Dr. Motoka. But I'm happy to sharing this information. Next page, please. Next page, please. So as I already mentioned, we plan to do overlapping of the ELOS 2 and the ELOS 4, and the target year is the Japanese fiscal year 2022. So please keep an eye of the successful launching of the ELOS 3. This is a high-resolution optical satellite, 
and will be launching in Japanese, this Japanese physical year. So we using the new launch vehicle, H3 launch vehicle for the GCLS3. So the second uh, uh, rocket will be using for the LS4. So we are highly dependent on the first success of the LS3 launching by the new launch vehicles in the this Japanese fiscal year. Therefore, the, you have to check in in the news of the LS3, although that is the optical satellite. Next page, please. So you may already know, and also I already said that in the strip map, strip map mode of the, of the observation wide swath widths will be changing from the 50 kilometer to the 100 kilometer or 200 kilometer. This is a very big advantage for the LS4 from the LS2. So, and also the uh, three meter mode of the high, high resolution strip mode should be dual polarization instead of single polarization. That is an improvement for the LS2 to the LS4. The next page, please. So this is, uh, I already explained, and the, the one observation can be covered all over the big, uh, big island of the Hawaii. So it's a very good thing. So next page, please. This is uh, testing pictures. So later you can see it. And the next page, please. We are continuing to do the PM float flight model testing of the, this satellite. Next page, please. And the observation con concept, you can see the, such kind of the observation concept in the, our homepage. So later, please check in that homepage. Next page, please. And the basic idea is the continuity of the LS2 observation for the LS4. And that is one of the way to make the LS4 observation scenarios. So next page, please. And this is the Japanese area. Maybe you don't, you, you are not so interested in the Japanese area observation, but the, our main observation area is a three meter mode of the observation by weekly in the Japanese areas. That is a first priority because we have to provide the just observation data and the basic observation should be covered in the basic uh, the surface map creation in Japanese areas. Next page, please. Next page, please. So the global observation currently, so this is a very early draft. We can do coordinating with NASA and ESA, but uh, at least once a year, we will have the 10 meter mode observation for the globe. It's the same as Japan. Ah, sorry, it was two. And the disaster base map, we just discussing how to covering the, by the which mode. This is still TBD. And also, as I already mentioned, we have the uh, big, currently big discussion about our corporate, uh, collaborative partner in Japan to maybe have uh, nine times per year with a certain areas with a 10 meter mode. This is a still discussion with our partners, but uh, not finalized yet. But uh, currently we targeting to have the some certain areas with a nine times per year with a dual polarization mode of the 10 meter. And also the plan to have the polar observation in the uh, three times per year. Next page, please. But because it's a, because too much data uh, in the, by using the uh, 200 kilometer source video observation, therefore the, we have to uh, just do zoning of the observation timing of the global coverage. Same as the polar observation. Next page, please. This is uh, very familiar with you. It's all the same. But the scanser mode, even the scanser mode, the source widows is uh, two times bigger than the uh, LS2. So LS2 is 350 kilometers, but the LS4 is uh, 700 kilometers. Therefore, the, it's a very huge area can be covered by using the scanser. And also, the, as I already mentioned, we have a very big discussion with our partners, and the, we may have the pattern A and the pattern B observation. And the pattern A is more. Uh, high frequent observation we discussing. And the pattern B is uh, like the same as the current observation for the LS2. 
next page, please. Maybe this is the last page. Oh, no, sorry. That's, uh, yeah, this is the so, final page. We have the, some discussion with the calibration validation science team uh, partners. And we have the discussion about how to create in the um, initial calibration validation phase and also starting of the regular observation. You can see that after the uh, launching, uh, seven, seven months after launching, we will have the regular observation. That is the current plan. So this is all I would like to share tonight. No, sorry, today for you. Thank you. It's great to hear, especially very exciting to hear about the ALOS 4 plans. Also, like three is going to be an amazing instrument. Um, so next, uh, we have an update from Isa uh, from Pierre Potan. Yes, so can you hear me? Yep. Right, so hello all. So in Europe, Central Europe, it's uh, 5.30, so it's still very okay for us. <laughs> Not like uh, Shinichi in Japan, uh, I'm, I'm more lucky for that. So I'll try to, to draw you a brief presentation on the menu of Sentinel-1 mission status. And uh, just to highlight that uh, we have reached uh, with Sentinel-1A uh, seven years of, uh, of operations. Already, time is flying. Uh, the launch was in, in, uh, in a priority, still uh, working very well, in a very good shape. Uh, and the same for the Sentinel 1B satellite. So, we have uh, a good uh, uh, overall uh, performance of the, of the mission with the two satellites in orbit. The mission still contributes to uh, quite a number of uh, emergency activations uh, worldwide, um, mainly for flood monitoring, but not only, uh, sometimes for um, to, to, to try to support uh, earthquake uh, or uh, volcano monitoring, to allow for uh, more frequent INSA, for instance. And we operate the mission uh, close to its full capacity, so it's difficult to accommodate additional observations. I think uh, last time I mentioned uh, the possible uh, constellation with the third satellite, so Sentinel 1C, but we had uh, on either side and with uh, another state a number of uh, discussions and we and with Russians. And we have some constraints uh, in terms of funding. And at the end, it was decided that we will unfortunately operate fully only uh, two satellites. So situation will remain the same. Uh, actually, we will replace Sentinel 1A by Sentinel 1C once uh, Sentinel 1C will be uh, commissioned. Uh, so it will not really change uh, the situation. Unfortunately, we, we plan to have a third satellite fully operational and uh, to have a new uh, orbital con um, configuration with three satellites, but this was not, uh, this is not really possible at time A. Things may evolve in the future during the operation. So we'll see. Next slide, please. Yes, so you certainly know well this uh, observation uh, scenario maps. Uh, there are two of them. This one is related to mode polarization observation geometry. Uh, maybe we can go to the next, which is uh, more interesting because it talks about repeat and uh, coverage frequency. As you can see, we have a strong focus over Europe where we basically take all the passes in uh, ascending, descending, and we are uh, at a six day repeat. But also Europe for the tectonic areas, we have, uh, we ensure um, uh, both ascending, descending geometry at 12 days. Actually, we have a repeat, uh, a revisit frequency of, uh, of 12 days outside Europe. And compared to a couple of years ago, we have uh, made some progress also. There are new sites where in red, where we are, uh, we managed to, to be at a six day repeats, in particular in the Western US. Um, so, no major changes as uh, we, we go on with this observation plan. Next slide, please. 
Yes, to mention that we have released recently uh, the so-called Sentinel Data Access uh, 2020 report. Uh, you get the URI on the on the bottom uh, right, and there is quite some information in this report, uh, not only on Sentinel One for the other Sentinels as well in terms of um, product data access. Uh, so you, you see here an example of a heat map of Sentinel One products uh, globally uh, on the top left and the bottom left. Uh, this is an example of a uh, heat map showing the archive exploitation uh, ratio of uh, Sentinel-1 uh, non-time critical product. And one thing to mention is uh, we are still uh, quite good in terms of uh, data access, data availability, because the average is uh, five, five hours and a an half uh, be between the sensing and the ability on the open data. Um, next slide, please. Yes, so this, as you know, Copernicus is a major European Earth Observation Program, and there are a number of Copernicus services which are financed by the, the European Commission. Operational services in many domains, and today Sentinel One is used in most of these Copernicus services. Um, so, so far, the, the INSAR uh, activities were rather limited. This is uh, changing a bit now as part of the Copernicus services. It is now used um, for specific activities as part of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service for risk and recovery. Uh, as you can see, it's highlighted in, in red on the slides. And more importantly, uh, as part of the European uh, land monitoring service, we have, uh, there is now a, a so-called European ground motion service, so it's limited to Europe area. And uh, there is, we are currently in the, in the production phase and the first product will be made available uh, early uh, next year. So um, I would say that kind of uh, delay has been recovered now we, because with uh, the, the INSAR techniques is seriously uh, taken also for the company services, which is uh, very good. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, just an illustration of uh, uh, an impressive interferogram that was generated uh, regarding the China earthquake that took place on the 21st of May. You see the, uh, how important is this uh, earthquake, and you see the on over the 250 kilometers swath, the impressive interferogram. I will not comment any uh, scientific, uh, let's say, derivation of this uh, of this interferogram, just to, to provide an example of uh, a, a very, uh, let's say, I would say, impressive example of uh, of uh, interferogram recently. And the same on the next slide, which is related to the earthquake, major earthquake in Haiti, and uh, I'm sure that. Uh, Many of you attending this meeting uh, will have uh, generated this type of um, interferogram uh, as well for this uh, major earthquake in, uh, in uh, Haiti. And I will conclude with the next slide, which is um, related to the plans for the next uh, SAR missions uh, uh, at ISA as part of the Copernicus uh, program. So um, as you can see, there will be the C units and D units that will actually take over the A and B units in the coming years. And uh, we will launch until 1C, as mentioned earlier. We, we will put until 1A in standby. Until uh, 1D will be kept on ground, uh, ground storage. We have started the, the studies definition of the next generation of Sentinel 1A, 1, sorry, Sentinel 1 and uh, NG, uh, with a plan to launch uh, in the around 20, uh, 31, 32. And uh, regarding the L band uh, Rosel SAR mission, uh, we are currently in the detailed definition of phase uh, with launch uh, planned around 28, uh, 29. This is it. Thank you for your attention. And thank, thank you for you. the invitation. Thank you, Pierre. It's, it's great to hear. I'm sorry to hear that the uh, Sentinel 1C won't operate at the same time as 1A and B, but understood. Um, it's, it's wonderful data that you guys are providing and a really impressive mission. 
Um, so, so the next uh, update is from uh, Gerald Bodden at NASA on the NASA's programmatic activities. So I'm starting to, to notice a little bit the time. Um, I'll just ask everybody to, to try to keep your presentations uh, as concise as possible so that we don't run out. Um, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, that's always a challenge at Winsar. There's so much good stuff that's going on, and it's hard to cover in a five-minute presentation. So um, I will try to stay as close as I can with it. Um, I'm NASA does not allow Zoom on things. So I'm working on my iPad, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video. But you got the sound coming through. So with it, I think. Um, most everybody's uh, interested in what's going on with NISAR. And so NISAR is being uh, tested, it's being integrated right now. Paul Rosen's going to be going into uh, depth or a little bit more depth than I am uh, in his presentations uh, coming up. But the, the key part here is that um, due to COVID and some engineering issues that uh, the, the launch of NISAR has been de uh, delayed till no earlier than kind of August, September of 2023. Um, and if we launch, uh, if the, all the hardware lines up uh, anytime after September, it will be delayed into January because we can't launch into an eclipse where the, a nice arrow go uh, around uh, into the shadow of the Earth. We can't open the boom, or we're not um, confident being able to go ahead and open the boom um, with basically heat contrast. But moreover, what's more important is to save the date. We are having our first major NISAR science community workshop at the Pasadena Community uh, uh, Convention Center, um, April 19th through uh, 21st. So this is the week after Easter. And this is going to start off, hopefully will be a um, maybe a biannual meeting with basic covering kind of like fringe, but uh, in the US. So um, next slide, please. Uh, this, this one includes an animation and hopefully it goes through. Um, NASA, in response to the decadal survey, uh, we are taking some of the key missions that were identified in the decadal survey and creating something called the Earth System Observatory, where with this, we're um, taking the different missions that are looking at individual pieces and trying to understand the Earth as a whole. So that cloud convection uh, and precipitation, aerosols. SDC is what we're seeing up here, and then surface biology and geology. So the surface deformation and change mission is the one that will follow NISAR and will be very much like a NISAR mission or have some of the same capabilities, but will, it may not necessarily be a clone of NISAR. I uh, hit the next slide, here we go. NISAR is going to serve as the trailblazer for the Earth System Observatory, so it's going to kick it off and SEC will follow. The whole objective here is instead of having individual missions, they actually have all these missions up working on the whole Earth at the same time. So this can be in addition to the current 23 um, uh, uh, missions that are in the current program record, so the ESO will be a separate dedicated piece with that. So next slide, dive a little bit into SDC. This is a similar slide that I showed uh, last year uh, for um, SDC. The instrument will be an INSAR with the ionospheric correction. We have a cost cap of around 500 million. And so what this means is it encourages partnerships. So we are looking at reaching out to um, our international colleagues, so ESA with Roselle, say JAXA with um, Alice Next, or whatever information it is, um, by the time uh, we get to the, time, uh, the period in which SDC would launch, which will be kind of the early uh, 2030 20, 20, uh, 20, time period. So if anybody's interested in learning more about SDC, we've got a whole dedicated uh, town hall at AGU. So it's at KH33K on Wednesday. Uh, please encourage you to uh, participate. Next. I am ecstatic to announce that we now have P-band interferometry um, for uh, science. And so this is on our UAV, uh, UAV SAR platform, so P-band's uh, 68 centimeter. Well, we've actually been testing the ability to go ahead and do operational P-band interferometry. What we're looking at here is Pacific Northwest. Um, the area of decorrelation in the center is the Columbia River with the state of Washington to north, Oregon to the south. And if we hit next, uh, we'll be able to take a look at um, an area that is densely vegetated. 
And this is a flight going uh, east to west, so left to right. And then the one uh, image on the right is right to left, so east to west. And how well that we are able to go ahead and image and track deformation in um, very vegetated areas. So um, I encourage any scientists that would like to go ahead and take advantage of uh, P-band interferometry to go ahead and propose the next rows of solicitation that um, would have to be researched. So it's been very effective. Our next flights are next week. So this will be go ahead repeating these flight plans to go ahead and cover this. So next, the other cool thing that we've had going is ASAR. This is a joint project with uh, ISRO um, and uh, NASA with the UAV SAR team. This is where we mounted an ISRO LMS band instrument on the UAV SAR platform. Uh, we had our first act, um, campaign in 2019 and then the pandemic hit. And so we were able to go ahead and get uh, get the flights that were canceled due through the pandemic and they were flown in June, July of this uh, past year. You can see a map of where they are. Uh, this does not do repeat pass for interferometry, so this is all star backscatter, but the whole objective is go ahead and prepare the community. Um, I think Young Ling will have a little bit of slide on uh, getting the data for this. So this will be at the community uh, coming up. Uh, first access will be for the ASAR science team members and uh, the NASA science team, and then from there it's going to be open data set to help encourage and prepare for NISAR. Next slide. Uh, this image of some of the uh, results of some of the preliminary data coming back from um, ASAR campaign. So uh, the upper left and the lower left are um, site in Southern California with Rosemont. And you can see that I'll say the crop circles, what they look like in L band on the top and S band on the uh, bottom, completely different backscatter properties. And the uh, image kind of in the center is Mammoth Mountain, both with the L and S band. So um, it's Took a lot of work for both NASA as well as uh, ISRO to go ahead and pull this off. Having inter international uh, hardware on a US plane flying over US territory had extra challenges with State Department, but we got all worked out and we got some wonderful data uh, to help us with NISAR. Uh, next slide. Another uh, item that I mentioned last year, which I want to go into detail, satellite needs working group. It's a US government activity to assess what the satellite needs are from all the different uh, uh, government agencies. Last time I uh, showed this list where we had uh, nine different activities that were proposed in the president's budget. All of these have been funded. The ones that here are in gold all have radar components to it. So the top one is doing global 200 meter soil moisture product from NISAR. And so Rowena Lohman is the, uh, is the science team lead on pulling this together. And she's doing a wonderful job with bringing all the different soil moisture groups together so that we have a product when NISAR launches. Um, item number two is a global surface water extent that includes optical, both NASA as well as ESA, um, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data, um, as well as um, uh, Landsat and NISAR when it launches as well as SWAT. Uh, item three is looking at land surface change detection. So this is using both optical and radar. And then the next one is basically North America deformation. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So next, hit the button once. Uh, the center three items are um, all managed by um, a NASA activity. Can somebody advance the slide? Here we go. Um, are being managed by OPERA. Uh, this is the operational capabilities that was developed from, um, out of ARIA. And Winsor's uh, very own David Beckard is the lead, the science lead for the, the OPERA activity. So um, if I'm not able to answer the question, David definitely will. Um, next slide, please. So here's just kind of a quick overlook with it. So for the North America deformation product, which I think uh, we are most interested in, um, what is North America? It's 200 kilometers inside Canada, all of Alaska, south down to Panama, and all the US territories. So every Sentinel-1 as well as NISAR pass would be uh, turned into a PSNSAR time series and see what the products the streams will ultimately work like, uh, work out with this. So this is, um, is funded by Congress and we're moving forward with it. Next slide, please. So 
this my last slide. I've got uh, you've already heard some of uh, the discussion between I guess NASA and JAXA uh, with regard to um, data. So ASF is a global uh, data mirror for PALSAR one data, as well as PALSAR um, uh, ScanSAR data. Um, we're in the process of receiving that data and uh, take. Um, I, uh, Wade Albright will go ahead and cover some uh, pieces in his presentation. We also have an agreement between the Alta JAXA and the US government. So NOAA, NASA, and USGS researchers are able to gain access to a little bit higher level data. So if there's anybody that qualifies for that, uh, work out with me, but it has to be research that has uh, done in collaborative approach between NASA and JAXA. And we're also um, exploring a NASA partnership with um, JAXA for being a downlink as well as the data distribution uh, node for um, ALICE uh, for SCANSAR. Uh, please go back. Um, I've got a couple, couple last pieces here. We've got uh, one uh, finest um, for basically how do you get funding for graduate students. Uh, the finest uh, through roses just hit the street a couple days ago. Um, the deadline is February 11th of this coming year. The funding for this has actually increased to uh, 50,000 a year. And so that um, is nice. Uh, we have the regular ROSES solicitation that uh, we're anticipated come out February 14th of 2022. Uh, ignore the one on there. And then um, I've got a couple other items on here that um, uh, I forgot to include. Surface topography and vegetation um, study. This is um, a thing that came out of the Decadal survey. And uh, with it, the, there's a study that is now out online for people to take a look at it. This is for working on doing global topography and vegetation from space. Um, there's a ROSES science and technology solicitation that is now under review. It's to help develop the technology that will help feed into both FCC as well as uh, radar for topography, ice elevation, vegetation uh, structure. And and I'm going to leave with um, that um, through the Satellite Needs Working Group and NASA CSDA, which is our commercial salt fat data acquisition program, we have um, made agreements with Planet, Fire, DSIS, which is a hyperspectral um, instrument on the International Space Station, as well as Earth Dem. These are commercial data sets that are now uh, available for US funded researchers. So you either work at a U.S. agency or you funded like an International Science Foundation uh, researcher. I will put links to both the STV uh, report as well as the um, uh, how to gain access to the commercial data uh, in the chat. So next slide. That's it. So a lot going on, even though we are in a pandemic, exciting times, nice hours around the corner, and we've got a lot of international partnership and we've got some uh, new data that's um, new capabilities, new data. So we're moving forward with genetic imaging. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gerald. Um, it's great to hear. It's, it's exciting to look forward to some of those um, new missions and, and new exciting things coming up. Um, okay, so the next person is Paul Rosen on NICER and ICE. Good morning, everyone. All right, so I'm going to give a pretty short presentation. Gerald already uh, talked about the, the schedule status for NISAR, which I'm sure is disappointing to everybody, myself included. Uh, if you could go, go back just a second. Uh, I just wanted to point out on this slide, the NISAR webpage is on the bottom left there. If um, you want to know about the characteristics of the mission, which I've briefed many times before at this meeting. Nothing has really changed, but if you've forgotten what they are, uh, please go there. Coverage is still the same, every uh, sending and descending every 12 days over all the land and ice covered surfaces. The instrument characteristics are also uh, pretty much unchanged throughout the development. Next slide. So uh, we have, I would not recommend building a satellite during a pandemic, it's not easy. Um, and we've had some technical challenges along the way this year, but we have made substantial uh, major progress since the last report I gave to you last year. Now the two radars, the L and S band radar are fully integrated. The S band showed up, uh, I think it was in uh, sometime this year, uh, earlier this year, and we fully integrated and tested it. We found some compatibility issues with uh, the two, two radars 
and have gone through some mitigation and troubleshooting activities, which have led to finding the problem and fixing it. So we're in the process of final stages of testing that fix. So you see the, on the left there, the technician replacing a susceptible box. And on the bottom, you see the fully integrated L and S band electronics that uh, are ready for the functional testing uh, now that this uh, compatibility issue has been resolved. So that's all relatively good news, despite the fact that it took a little bit extra time to do it. Next slide. I showed you last year the, the uh, vignette on the left. Uh, Looks like you froze there. I'm not sure if you can hear us. Is ready, almost ready to be integrated <clears throat> with the uh, with the uh, with the mechanical system, and that's going to be coming up. Um, in the meantime, we've been doing a lot of development on the mission system side, and have been developing scenarios for running the mission with ISRO directly, and we've actually held mock system tests where people on both sides of the Pacific are, uh, are sitting at their consoles and executing operational sequences. So this is becoming real for everybody, uh, both at the hardware and the mission systems level. Uh, we also have some other hardware from ISRO that's coming in, the data handling box, which is a major component that was a new development that needed to be tested. That came to JPL and actually has finished testing. Everybody's gone home and everything works great. So this is uh, all great progress getting ready for the next year of full integration. Next slide. So that's it on ISAR. Uh, I'm gonna talk about ICE a little bit now, and this is very high level. Uh, you heard all about the training sessions. Um, so I won't say much, very much about that. Uh, all our software has been open sourced, both the ICE2 development, which is the traditional thing that we do our training on. You can see the uh, web uh, page here is the github.com with uh, the handle ICE framework ICE2 for the old, older heritage software. The training is in a area called Geosync, uh, which is, has a, a UNAVCO segment and, a, and another segment in it. All of the notebooks that we use for training at UNAVCO this summer are there and should be up to date. And you can also, of course, go to the UNAVCO site to get the actual uh, recordings that uh, Chris mentioned earlier. Next slide. The ICE-3 development uh, is what we're using operationally for NISAR. Uh, this is still being developed and doesn't have the full capability that ICE-2 has at the moment. And uh, at some level, it, it's not going to have all the higher level time series uh, capabilities because that's not needed for the project unless the community develops them. And, uh, but it is open source and those opportunities exist. The latest version that you see on the website, uh, if you went to this website here, will be very close to what we are using uh, within the project. We don't have a fully integrated development cycle between what's going on on the project side and the public facing uh, um, web page. So there's a little bit of a lag between the latest capability and what you see on the web page. but this is actually very close. It's not not so so many days old. Uh, the other thing that's new is we're developing an on-demand uh, system, a little bit similar to the Open SAR Lab, but specifically targeted for the uh, science team during uh, operations for NISAR. It's a cloud-based environment that's co-located with the archive that NISAR will have. And it has a number of notebooks uh, that uh, are sample notebooks for how one would uh, process NISAR data. This is not open to the public yet, but we are in the process of making it uh, accessible to those outside of the JPL firewall, which is one of the main issues, and figuring out how uh, we can pay for a larger community to look at it. So this is a, under development next year. I hope to report that things are much more available 
to everybody even beyond the science team. But this is a, a, an exciting development to have a fully integrated set of data and tools on the cloud that uh, NASA, that's the direction NASA is going with uh, processing. It may solve some of the issues, for example, with the ALOS2 ginormous data sets that uh, you don't really wanna have to download if you can avoid it. Next slide. Uh, final slide, and Yunling may say more about this. We've generated a number of simulated NISAR products uh, that uh, from the UAV SAR data set. They have the same bandwidth, the same noise levels, and some of them are interferometric. Uh, so, you, and there are quite a few of them at various places around the world. You can go to the UAV SAR website and you see a simulated NISAR button and can sort based on that. And from that, you should be able to uh, use the ICE3 software and the readers there to be able to uh, look at these data and explore their characteristics. Next slide. We hope to have uh, a set of sort of training modules and uh, data sets packaged in a way that when we get to the science community workshop in April, uh, those who come can receive uh, information about how to use the data and uh, maybe play with it uh, either at the workshop or surrounding the workshop. So I hope you'll all register. The information for registration is right here. And uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Paul. It's great to hear about that. Um, and, and yeah, it's great that uh, ICE3 is going to be kind of updated in near real time for, for the community. It's really, really exciting. Uh, so next up is uh, David Sandwell on GMT SAR. Okay, good morning or evening, everyone. Um, I just have one slide, so hopefully we can get on schedule. Um, so I'm here to talk about GMT SAR, and you can see in the upper left here are the main developers that are involved in this. Um, and you see two people that are the key developers of GMT. They're currently developing something called Pi GMT, and one of our objectives is to do a Pi GMT SAR. So we work closely with the GMT developers. A little bit about funding. Um, we're in the final year of our NSF cyber infrastructure funding, and we're currently writing a new proposal um, from UT and UCSD. And um, the main activities will be to prepare for NISAR. We're excited about that. And we want to be able to deploy GMT SAR on the uh, Amazon Web Services to be close to the Sentinel archive and the NISAR archive. We think this is important, and I think the NISAR group is doing the same thing. Um, we've deployed the software on basically all Unix platforms and also Windows, um, because Windows can run Ubuntu, and, and that works nicely. And we're, we're just moving everything to the cloud. That's going to be in our, our new proposal. Um, Oh yeah, I should say a couple more things about the new proposal. Um, we want to develop tools to integrate uh, the left-looking NISAR with the right-looking Sentinel. I think that'll be pretty important to get the full vector deformation time series and also include G GPS data. And that leads to this um, fourth bullet down here about the community geodetic model. This is an activity that's funded by NASA through SCEC and I think this has actually been a really important activity for all of us. Um, we, there's a group here you see that are each developing time series of INSAR GNSS for Southern California using different softwares, ICE and GMT SAR, but also using different um, uh, criteria and, and approaches. And, and I think through this activity, we're coming up with the best practices, how to make INSAR time series, say with Sentinel-1. And, and I think this should, should really continue um, because there's a lot of decisions you can make during the um, processing. Um, one of the things here on the right is um, lower right, the NSF uh, requires metrics for our um, investigation. And so we've kept track of things, um, GitHub on the GitHub repository. One of the things is, is the number of citations. You can see that's going up. Um, almost a factor of two every year. So this is good news. I think a lot of people are using GMT-SAR. There's a lot of international users um, that use this. So uh, 
And we're probably going to phase out the DEM generation part because that's being done um, at a number of places. And then finally, we had a UNAVCO short course that you heard about. The next slide um, shows uh, the instructors. And we thank all these instructors. We, we try to break the, the students up into smaller groups of 20 or so to have individual hands-on instruction with um, installation and other issues. And, and I think that works um, pretty well. So we want to continue that with, with UNAVCO. And um, Donna and, and Alyssa have really helped us out at UNAVCO. So. So that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. Um, it's great progress. And, uh, and yeah, good luck for the, for the next cycle of funding. Um, Doom TSAR has been a great um, option for everyone to have. Um, the next uh, person is uh, Stefano Salvi about the Geo Super Sites initiative. Thank you, Eric. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Next, please. Thank you for inviting me again to the Windsor meeting. And um, okay, brief update from uh, the GSNL initiative. We expanded the network of super sites, uh, uh, adding, next one, adding uh, this year uh, a volcano super site in Nicaragua. And uh, um, we are talking about a uh, new super site in Costa Rica at present, but this is still in the air. Next, please. Uh, again, uh, the volcano super site in Nicaragua, then um, in general, uh, our super site uh, are still continuing, uh, I mean, uh, as basic as usual, they continue to use uh, amount, good amounts of CO's data for research mostly expand data uh, because they are not uh, totally free and open and um, and they use them for uh, monitoring and response uh, during crisis we we produce a number of biennial reports from each super site which are made available on, on the website uh, and they contain the advances in science and, and open data then we um, we can hide, we have uh, these highlights from a super site uh, results that have been crucial for managing uh, the White Island uh, eruption last end of uh, 2019 and are in fact important now for the assessment of responsibilities and, and there is a big trial going on in, in New Zealand. And then they've been also uh, instrumental for monitoring the uh, dikes in the eruption in Reykjans near uh, Reykjavik and at Etna uh, this year also. Uh, we maintain uh, cloud computing resources that we provide to uh, less developed super sites, uh, but uh, at present we only have Ecuador uh, using them. And we also uh, made uh, accessible data uh, over a thousand, uh, uh, ten thousand uh, CSK data and the number of TSX uh, data, plus some player data, which be uh, not of interest to you because they are optical, very high resolution, but they will be very soon available also on the ESA uh, Gerardsar exploitation platform. Next, please. Number of results, uh, just. Uh, a few highlights, okay. Um, okay, let's say first uh, for the San Andreas Fault Natural Laboratory, we have uh, um, not many users, actually only a few users using uh, Cosmos Climate Data. The last uh, data set which was used uh, was for the Ridgecrest earthquake. And uh, uh, a big point now here is that uh, the coordinator of the, of the natural laboratory is, uh, uh, has resigned, Chuck Weeks from USGS. And so we're, uh, we're looking for a replacement. And please, if you're interested, contact me because otherwise the, the functioning of this uh, laboratory uh, will, will finish soon. Uh, then uh, the Taupo super site in New Zealand again. This is uh, uh, some results from White Island and the ground deformation during the crisis and 
before the crisis and after were, were also important for the uh, assessing uh, what could have been done before and, and what uh, was not done maybe uh, at a good level. And uh, Ecuador is also doing a good job with uh, Cosmos Cayman and Terrasarix and of course Sentinel-1. They have now uh, capacities, uh, we, we've been helping them, uh, the Instituto Biophysico there, and uh, they're, they're becoming, let's say, independent in, in cell processing. And a few other, I don't want to be too long, and a few other results from ISO and so on. Go ahead. Next. We still have some uh, uh, issues due to the fact that we are, uh, um, let's say, uh, an open access, uh, an open science, uh, voluntary initiative under GEO. Uh, so uh, the, the level of open access to data is, especially in situ data, is still lagging behind uh, at some super sites. Uh, we, we would like to do more in, in providing support to some less developed super sites, like in, in Latin America, in, in Africa for the Virunga super site. But uh, we, we can't at the moment because we, last, we lacked resources. Uh, and GEO has not been so helpful so far in, in providing access to international funding, which was one of the objectives. Uh, one of the super sites uh, has been uh, uh, not so active in the, in the last two years, and the CEOs has decided to withdraw support of data. And please note that the San Andreas Fault Natural Laboratory could be the next because Again, we, we lack a coordinator now, and if there is, um, I mean, if the super site and the natural laboratory in this case is not uh, requesting data for a number of years, the CEOs may, um, might uh, withdraw support. And um, again, we thank uh, all the space agencies in the CEOs, uh, and ESA in particular for support, also financial support, but we still have uh, limited access to JAXA and CSA data. And we have, a, a, let's say, um, an agreement in principle with CONAE for access to SAUCOM data, L-band data, but uh, this is still in the, in the air. Uh, there is a lot of bureaucracy to be done. So maybe this next year, maybe we will have that. This is my, uh, I guess, last slide, uh, Eric, thanks. Great, thank you. I'm sorry to hear that the, the San Andreas Fault super site isn't being used well enough. We should all try to make use of that data because it's a, it's a really wonderful resource that, that you've organized and provide. So thank you. Um, the next uh, person is uh, Yunling Lu from uh, UAVCR from GPL. Hello. Uh, let's see. Um, this year, UAV SAR has resumed flight campaign pretty much without much disruption, which is great. Um, although the SMATVAX and above experiments were postponed to next year. So in all, we flew more than uh, 400 flight hours. And um, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so we have um, some of the, the uh, flights that are uh, of interest to you include the Central San Andreas Fault, which we have imaged in June this year, but you know we've had the time series for a long time. And also uh, the slow moving landslides in uh, uh, around the Bay Area, and um, also the Salton Trough area that's uh, with Andrew Donnellan's uh, Quakes Imager. So that's really exciting that we now have an, uh, a high resolution imager that we'll be able to generate DEM from um, coincident with the UAV SAR images. And we also um, image some opportunistic uh, wildfire data. Next chart, please. So um, another area that used um, L-band differential INSAR 
that we've uh, supported is the, the Snow X campaign and also the Delta X campaign. For the Snow X campaign, we provided weekly flights from mid January through late March that covered uh, different snow conditions. And this will allow the Snow X team to uh, figure out what snow conditions uh, Alban INSAR is likely to work. Um, in other words, to maintain co coherence. So they're looking at this uh, from the perspective of using uh, NISAR data to uh, study snow. So they specifically, they will be quantifying the accuracy of Alban INSAR retrievals of snow depth, uh, density, uh, snow water equivalent, and uh, wetness. So here's an example of what they did last year where they had uh, looked at one site where they saw uh, by comparing to LIDAR data, the UAV SAR differential INSAR data was able to uh, retrieve snow water equivalent to about one centimeter accuracy, which is what they're looking for. So that's uh, really exciting. And this year with more varied snow condition, they'll be able to test it. Uh, to test the robustness of uh, this technique. For Delta X, we flew uh, two campaigns. Um, that's uh, an Earth Venture suborbital mission. And uh, for the spring campaign, that was for High Mississippi River Discharge and the fall campaign, which uh, was for the Low Mississippi River Discharge. And they were using L-band differential INSAR um, you know, we would fl fly over the same area um, every 20 minutes so we can really me measure the water level changes within the marshes and also infer water surface velocity. And at the same time, they're also estimating above ground biomass uh, as well as assessing the ability to map shallow water uh, bathymetry from uh, LBAN data. So this is uh, really exciting stuff. And they've seen that the water level change within wetlands, uh, we are able to measure to within five millimeter accuracy. Next chart, please. So as Paul uh, has mentioned earlier, we're providing simulated NISA products. And um, that we've been doing uh, generating processing data for a, a little more than a year. And these RSLC products in HDF5 files are the same format that NISAR is uh, using. And you can download the data, like uh, Paul said, uh, from the UAV SAR work website, and you just click on that simulated NISAR button. And so far, we have generated over 430 products. So um, people have been using. Um, the simulated NISAR products for polarimetry as well as INSAR uh, stack, in, uh, stack uh, SLC stack analysis. So it's really exciting that you will be able to uh, get used to get ready for NISAR with UAVSAR data. So one thing we're thinking of doing is uh, generating UAVSAR products uh, with the na you know the native UAV SAR resolution and noise characteristics, but in a nice R format, the HDF5 format, so people don't have to deal with uh, different data analysis uh, tools. So that's something we're thinking of. Okay, next, please. Um, so we've been doing LBAN, supporting LBAN landslide study for a long time. And lately, um, Professor Zhong Lu of SMU has this landslide study with PBAN UAV SAR. And what he showed here on the right is by comparing UAV SAR PBAN data and ALOS uh, L. PALSAR2 L-band data, we can see that the uh, we have improved in INSAR coherence because of the vegetation penetration and also uh, improved sensitivity in deformation detection. So here he shows a number of very small uh, slide, 
uh, landslides in the Pacific Northwest in, in Oregon, where you can see the difference in coherence as well as phase signature between uh, the P-bands data and the uh, L-band data. So we'll be flying next week to uh, add to this observation data sets. And these data will be available at the UAVSAR website for download as well. Okay, next chart, please. Um, the Israel ASAR data for both L-band and S-band data can be downloaded at this website. So we, we're hosting this. And so we've acquired data in 2019 and 2021. And the data format is also in NICER RSLC format. And also they have GeoTIFF and JPEG files uh, for quick looks. And um, ISRO has delivered about 60% of the data acquired in 2019. Uh, however, they have just improved the geolocation accuracy and they just started re-delivering the data again. So we received some data just this week, and we also received maybe a dozen uh, of 2021 data sets. And this is for both L-band and S-band. So I welcome you to go to that website and uh, download some data to take a look at the difference between L and S-band. Okay, I think that's all. Oh, there's one more chart on next gen. So we've been working to uh, develop the next gen UAV SAR to improve robustness and maintain current capabilities, as well as adding new capabilities to support future mission technology developments. And we have just been uh, selected uh, a new IP to demonstrate uh, technology, to develop technology for digital beam forming, synthetic aperture, across multiple platforms and that is uh, reconfigurable. So this will allow us to develop, deploy low frequency, large aperture radars uh, by leveraging small sat docking and undocking capability. So um, that technology is developed by multiple organizations. So uh, we will build this technology and demonstrate with UAV SARS active array antenna and in the future, we will be able to uh, uh, migrate it uh, to uh, multiple small sat pl platforms for spaceborne observations. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's great to hear. The uh, UAV SAR instrument is, is an exciting uh, technology, and it's, it's interesting to think about small sat. Uh, in SAR2, that's a pretty, pretty neat concept. So we're, we're coming to the end of the time, uh, but we have one last presentation from ASF by Wade Albright, and then hopefully people can stick on for a few minutes for discussion, but um, also I encourage you to send uh, your any questions and comments uh, you know, to me by email, and, and we'll make sure they get incorporated. Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Wade Albright. I'm the Deputy Director at ASF also the uh, deck manager for the NASA SAR deck here at ASF. I'll try and be brief. Uh, as you heard in uh, Shinichi-san's presentation, we are a global mirror for ALOS-1 and we will be a global mirror for ALOS-2 scan SAR data. All of the AVNIR-2 for ALOS-1 has been ingested and is available in the Earth's data cloud. We are transferring the PALSAR-1 global mirror data to ASF now. We're about 50% complete. As that data gets to ASF, it is available for search and discovery and download through the NASA Earth Data Cloud. So a good portion of that archive is now available. We heard from our uh, UWG this past year that uh, you would prefer to get the ALOS 2 data first. So we will be, uh, we recently got permission from NASA to have the conversation with JAXA. So we'll be discussing that with Shinichi-san to see if we can get ALOS 2 uh, reprioritized ahead of ALOS 1. You also heard from Gerald that there is a project for restricted data access uh, that if you are a NASA approved scientist and you're collaborating with a JAXA uh, scientist, you can get uh, requested ALOS 2 scenes of any beam mode. We're getting about 1500 scenes per year for that. Also new to ASF this past year is uh, Joseph Kellendorfer's Global Seasonal Sentinel-1 Interferometric Coherence and Backscatter data set. We're working to get that into uh, ASF's uh, DAC now. It is 
available though in the AAWS Open Data Registry currently. And so that will be available through ASF soon, but if you wanna get it sooner, uh, that's the link where you can grab it from. Next slide. You heard last year, uh, we improved our interfaces for Interferometric SAR. We have the baseline tool as well as the SBAS tool that is uh, you see here. And this past year, we uh, improved that by, once you identify uh, scenes and interferograms that you'd like to get, you can add them directly from this interface into our on-demand interface, next slide, where you can have them processed to interferograms. And so we have, uh, anybody can order, I think currently the queue is about 200 scenes uh, a month for interferometric uh, processing. We use the gamma processor and it's all done in the cloud. You, but those uh, resulting products are not permanently archived. So they're only available for two weeks. So you have two weeks to download them or they'll be deleted. Uh, we have an INSAR story map created to walk you through the process if you need help with that. We also work closely with the MintPy team to uh, enable the use of MintPy for using these products for time series analysis. In addition to the INSAR on-demand processing, we also have uh, auto rift processing. This is a result of the It's Live project at JPL led by Alex Gardner. This is a glacier tracking, uh, feature tracking product. And we have radiometric terrain correction for Sentinel-1 as well. There's a story map uh, walking you through that as well. So those are the big things in on-demand, next slide. One of the other big changes at ASF this past year, as you heard from Gerald Bodden, was the SNWG product, Silent Needs Working Group, uh, and the resultant project at JPL, the Opera project with David Beckert, is creating the land surface displacement products, which ASF was awarded this past year. We will ingest, archive, and distribute those products. Um, our interface will be burst-based search and discovery. We should have uh, directory access. As I mentioned, we are working closely with David's team. Uh, we hope to have the intermediate products, the radiometric train corrected and encouraged three LSL CSACs for Sentinel-1 available in 2023, with displacement products being available in 2024 and the NICER products in 2025. Next slide. So ASF is planning to take those products that the Opera team creates and uh, create useful inter, uh, visualization and search and discovery interfaces for them. Um, they will be integrated with Vertex if that's feasible or standalone interfaces if it doesn't work out in how we have Vertex now. Hopefully you're all familiar with Vertex. Uh, this audience is also one of our key audiences for these surface displacement products. So if you have any ideas of things that you think would be very useful, please reach out to us. We would love to hear your ideas of what would uh, be a useful search discovery or visualization tool. These are some of the things on the screen here that we're, we're thinking of. One of the goals that I have for ASF is we're trying to reduce the amount of time that scientists have to spend with logistics, search and discovery, and let them spend more time doing science. So if you have ideas of ways that we can improve on that, please let us know. Next slide. And finally, we're going to be at AGU. ASF just recently celebrated 30 years of existence in making SAR data more accessible. Uh, so come visit us at AGU and we hope to see you all there. Thanks so much, Wade. Um, it's really exciting the, the efforts you guys have, have made there at ASF. It's a really great service to the whole community. So thanks Thank so you. much. Um, so, okay, so we're a little bit over time, but um, I hope it's all right. If, if you guys don't have to run, we can have a few minutes left for, for questions and comments from anybody. Um, and otherwise, you know, please send them, send them to me later and I'll, I'll integrate them into our next uh, WinSAR meeting and make sure that your, your voices are heard. Um, any questions from anybody to the speakers or, or to us as Winsar? I have one question for you all. Um, one of the things that's that's been suggested to, to us is to try to um, possibly host different types of data products. So we, we you know, Winsar hosts, you know, the archive of uh, legacy SAR data, but we also have derived data products that are uploaded by individual users. But uh, we could consider trying to host things like uh, weather models or or other data products that would be interesting. Um, are there any things that you uh, that you all would really love to see WinSAR push forward in in kind of our our um, data services, software services, um, training? 
courses that we could that we could host? What would you like to to have more of from us? This Dave Sandwell. Um, I was I was impressed by the uh, the work that the intern did at, at UNAVCO over the summer, breaking up the, uh, the the teaching into these modules. And I think I think continuing that you could do it with GMT SAR. I think that would be a good thing, really. So people could go online and learn how to do INSAR or LIDAR or whatever, um, in you know a well documented way. So that's that was good. Yeah, thanks. I think that was a was a really neat um, thing she was able to do. That that worked out super well, I think. And David, would you be interested in partnering with UNAVCO for this coming summer, perhaps, to do a similar thing? We'll focus maybe on GMTCR since we focused yeah. on ice this past summer. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Our our notes are not well organized, and we could use some help. So that'd be great. Okay. Um, Maybe you and I should connect offline and chat about about that because actually we're starting to put out the use of internship position announcements. They usually go up at AGU time, so this is a, the appropriate time to have that conversation. Okay, great. All right. Well, any other questions, comments, ideas? Melissa, is everybody able to unmute themselves? I know we had increased the security on that. They should be. Or they can, there's, there might also be a, a raised hand feature that they can use. Okay. Sure. Okay. Well, I guess we should um, wrap it up then since we're a little bit over time. Thanks everybody for attending. Um, I hope to see some of you in person at AGU if you'll be around. Uh, the WinSAR committee has organized a session on you know, big data and, and uses of WinSAR. So hope to see you there uh, as well as some of the other sessions and uh, you know, see you maybe next year in person. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks. good to thanks see everybody. Thanks to the speakers especially. Yeah.